Good evening. My name is Chaya Masinta. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Our topic tonight is a continuation of a talk given by Dr. Yael Kadish two weeks ago on how to recognize depression and anxiety in the home. Our two panelists will be discussing the signs, diagnostics, and treatment of depression and the various kinds of anxieties that are found in adults, adolescents, and children. They will discuss how the signs of depression and anxiety manifest so differently and how different the treatment and causes are in adults and children. They will also discuss eating related difficulties such as anorexia and bulimia, which is unfortunately so common today. So let me introduce our two panelists for tonight. Dr. Yael Kadish is a psychoanalyst, clinical psychologist, and an advanced candidate in psychoanalytic training. She is the principal psychologist at Tara Hospital. Yael is also a senior lecturer in the Department of Psychology at Wits University. Over and above that, she also has a small private practice where she deals with anxiety and depression in adults and adolescents. Our second panelist is Sherry Hansen, who is a social worker in private practice. Sherry has worked in NGOs, both within the Jewish and the broader community. She has a special interest in working. I think we might have uh, lost Chaya, everyone, but uh, Sherry and, and Dr. Kadish, thank you so much for joining us again. So Dr. Kadish was here last week and we're continuing this conversation. You heard it, a psychologist and a psychoanalyst. And then also Sherry, you're new to the panel today. Uh, we've been so lucky every Thursday we gather here and we get to chat about things that have not just bothered us in lockdown, but also how to get out of that rut and loopy thoughts of it. We've discussed lepidology, inclusivity, how to be resilient, the glue of the family. We've had amazing chats. And then last week, we started talking about anxiety and depression. And doctor, based on people's interest and the amount of clicks that we've had on the Chabad South Africa page, we thought, let's bring this conversation back because it's such an important one to have. Sherry, just to give everyone a bit of introduction about you, a social worker, as Chaya has said, as well as working in the community, uh, volunteering with Hadzola. Uh, so it's really wonderful to, to unpack this and to have you with us today as we are discussing the topic that we just mentioned, how to recognize depression and anxiety in the home. I also wanna say this, this is on my heart tonight. So Sherry and Dr. Yael, you could have chosen any career in life and it is wonderful that you are in the business of helping people. So we wanna say thank you for your time tonight and thank you for helping humans because we need you and it's so important. I'm gonna fall into our first question. Depression in adults. Now, had this not been lockdown and COVID-19 and all these other really hectic things that have come our way, losing our businesses, others are thriving. I saw an article this week about how South Africans have invested in unit trust during this time. But if it, if it wasn't for lockdown, what would, what would signs of depression look like? Let's quickly start there. So the signs are the same. I think you, that you bringing up um, the stress of COVID is very important, Ilana, because that, you know, things have changed dramatically as we were discussing last time. But so there, there's some key signs to watch out for. So if you, so you or your loved ones have a low mood, not for a day or two days or three days, but for you know, two weeks, say, and there's a loss of taking pleasure in life, the sorts of things that you used to enjoy doing, you just feel flat, you just aren't into it anymore. Um, other things to watch out for is a change in your sleeping patterns, either sleeping much more or you know, inability to fall asleep and or when you're asleep, you wake up early, you can't get back to sleep. Change in appetite, over or under eating, um, you know, to do with your mood. And so th there are a lot of symptoms like that and including a problem with concentration. Mm. So, you know, you've got to watch those things. And if you've got one of them, it won't mean that you're depressed. But the most important ones to watch out for is this very low mood and the loss of pleasure in things that you normally would take pleasure in. So. Those are really the things that, that we look at when we try and, and assess whether a person is depressed or not. 
Now, I would want to ask whether it looks different in adults and, and different in young people or adolescents or children. Sherry, having worked with people and, and our community and the community at large, what would you say? Does it look different in young people? Aren't they just tired? You know, I saw an article in the week that came out that said we must stop calling our children lazy, you know, that it's perhaps a time for them to rest. So immediately mom guilt and parent guilt sets in because now there's another layer to this big word depression that we are already, I think, extremely terrified of. I think, Ilana, with, with teenagers, they have similar signs and symptoms to, to adults, but they present in a different way. Because, you know, the whole, the whole challenge of being a teenager is that you have hormones raging around, um, your, your frontal um, court, your, your frontal lobes not matured yet. So your ability to self-regulate and your impulsivity is not um, where it should be. So a lot of the things that we we see as abnormal in adults are, are pretty normal for teenagers. Um, the important thing that, that we need to kind of tap into with teenagers is that we have to maintain a relationship with them. We have to be able to have open communication with our children so that we can know what their baseline is. Every child enjoys something different. Every child reacts differently to things. If we know what our own children's baseline is, then we can see when things are going um, array for them and when they're not okay. And that, and by doing, by talking to our children, by having those little incidental contacts. And I think, you know, with COVID, there's been a lot of um, sort of time to connect, but for some people it's, it's not been so easy. And sometimes parents time to connect has been with children being, being in the car, locked in the car with them, dropping them here or dropping them there. And a lot of that's been lost. And children are increasing their screen time, which has its, its downfall and its tendency to depress children as well. So I think there are a lot of extra factors that are, are extra layers that have been added on now during lockdown. I love how this you've mentioned, which is the communication aspect, you know, get to know your children or even get to know yourself. And then the sense of empathy where you understand what this person is going through, but you can only know that if you have actually spent time with them. I love the pattern thing. So, so if parents, us as our partners or as self, if we had to have a checklist to recognize um, whether the depression has now happened or not, if you had to say that there's five things or six things or a few things that we need to look out for, what would it be? Because so far, what I'm gathering is, is that depression could look different for everybody, depending on what you are used to in life. You know, if you're generally a happy person, you become sad. It could be sadness or depression. But what if you're just generally a very laid back person? You know, if you could give us five things to look out for, what would they be if you are trying to establish whether you are depressed or not? I think with, with teenagers, you're looking, uh, the same with, it was with adults, you're looking at sleep and eating changes. Um, and again, I just want to reiterate what, what Yael had said, you know, having to, you need to take these things in a context and with a pattern. You can't suddenly see that your teenager's eating enormously and you think, oh my goodness, they're depressed. Teenagers go through spurts where they eat differently. So you're going to look at, um, you know, changes, either not sleeping at all or sleeping too much changes in eating, and then that sense of just despair and hopelessness, what, um, you know, what is there to do, we've lost, and, and I think this is again where it's very difficult, because children who are, for example, very sporty, um, if, if we took COVID out of the picture, and they suddenly decided they're not going to be playing sport anymore, that would be a signal for a parent that something's up, but we've now lost that because they've lost that, so we're having to see, you know, what is that, what, are, what is the conversation with our children? Are they saying things that are despairing? Are they feeling like there's no point to their life anymore? We have to listen out to the things that, um, that they mention and that they don't mention. Um, you know, if, if, you, if you have a child who is very withdrawn usually and all of a sudden they become a little bit manic, that's a sign that something's not okay with them. We have to see, we, we're looking for changes in behavior.
right? That's a, that's a great summary. So change in behavior and even in self, right? Like you, you don't normally have road rage and now all of a sudden you, you are raging. I see that there's a few eyes that have joined us tonight. A warm welcome. Good evening. Uh, also, if you want to see the full recording of tonight, it's always live on the Chabad South Africa page. So please click and like us on Facebook so that you can uh, have more insight on this conversation if you've missed anything out. Now we're speaking to Sheree as well as to Dr. Kadish who joined us last week. Uh, uh, great to have Sheree with us, with us tonight. I see that there's already a few of you commenting. So if you have any questions to our two experts, please go ahead and ask some. We'd love to hear from you. Dr. Yael, earlier I mentioned COVID and I realized that there's another layer to this conversation. I know last week we touched on eating disorders. I realized today when a friend phoned me up and said, you know what, we've lost people during COVID. Long life to those who have and that things might seem really bad at the moment, but they have a fear of things getting even worse because there is now another layer to this very, very hectic time for all of us, and that is death. So I realized that we going through these different, uh, Sherry, you just said it, sport, no sport, in the car, not in the car, COVID, no COVID, lockdown, no lockdown, and now also life and death, you know? apart from the fact that some of our businesses have been affected and so on and so on. When diagnosis happens, first of all, how does it happen and how important is it? Because if I was suffering from depression, I wouldn't want to know, isn't that, isn't diagnosis even more depressing, doctor? So Ilana, what, what you're raising is very important and on the back of the context you've put it. So Yes, there really have been losses, the losses that, that you and Sherry have touched on, and then actual loss of life. And one of the most important distinctions that we make in the mental health world is between mourning, normal mourning and bereavement and grief and depression. And they can be difficult to, to disentangle. And, and that's because someone who is bereaved looks quite a lot like someone who's depressed in a lot of ways. And grief is very normal and very healthy. In fact, when people don't grieve, we worry. We worry why there's a frozenness around them. So that's, that's an important thing to watch out for people who are in a state of loss, but they're so frozen, they're in such shock. It's such a trauma that they're not grieving. So that's, that's something really to watch. And, and then on the other hand, there's depression. And, you know, I can maybe put it in, get to the, the heart of the matter that with depression, it isn't clear to the person often and to the family, what is it? What is the cause of this? So the person just, it's almost like the lights get switched off, you know, in that person. They lose their sparkle, they lose a sense of a future, um, their whole energy changes. And it's really worrying to see, of course, some people try and cover it up and, and try and behave as if they're upbeat. And I think as, as Sherry was talking about, you know, children and especially teenagers with teenagers, they've got so many different mood swings. Um, you know, it, it's even harder to see, um, but, but with adults, so, so one can pick that up sometimes and, and then not be sure what to do, what to say. Should you say anything? Is this temporary? So when we come to diagnosis, and it was something we spoke about last time, what is important about diagnosis is that, you know, depression is an illness. It is something that is really serious and it's really incapacitating. Mm -hmm. And it, it takes away from quality of life on a massive scale. And, and why should you have to suffer when there really is treatment? So that's why diagnosis, because at least if you know what you're struggling with, then you can try and start to find solutions with professionals. And you can also maybe start to share with people if you feel comfortable to do so or not. You know, some people just don't feel comfortable. But so that's why diagnosis is important. But again, diagnosis, is that a label? Well, you know, People do all sorts of funny things and we can't account for what other people do. But taking care of oneself or one's loved ones, you know, needs to be the most important priority 
what other people are going to say we can never control so we can't we shouldn't invest in that I think you're reading my mind, doctor, because that's my next point. And Sherry, I'm going to direct this one to you. But you said something really comforting and reassuring that knowing your diet or, or knowing or having a diagnosis is another step in understanding and knowing yourself, which is a lot of progress. So that's what we want during this time, right? Not just in, in lockdown, but generally in life about self. Sherry, what is your experience, especially working with the community and with families around judgment? Because we are, I mean, as humans, we are so quick to judge if you're feeling sad, mom mm -hmm. guilt, you know, the fact that you should have, could have, would have, I shouldn't have raised my voice at device time. Or, you know, we, we're so quick to judge ourselves as humans. I can't even imagine, and, and, and doctor just went there now with, with the idea of when, when there's a diagnosis, there might be people that are judging you. What kind of reassurance around that can you give us around judgment look i think that judgment's a big deal and we it, it's a very real thing in our community that um you know we know we're near where we need to be in terms of understanding and accepting mental illness and the problem with not accepting and understanding mental illness and placing judgment on it is that we we completely inhibit treatment when we do that mm -hmm. so as soon as we allow people to understand that um, as much as you would treat appendicitis or cancer or a heart attack, we need to treat mental illness um, and there shouldn't be a stigma attached to it. I think amongst the youth, I've been seeing a lot less of a stigma than, than what I see with adults. Um, they're more comfortable with the concept of talking to people, um, of reaching out for help. And I think that that is quite a big deal, but I think we're still, we're not where we need to be yet around um, destigmatizing um, mental health. Last week with Dr. L, we started talking about therapy and how important it is to actually talk to someone. Doctor, I want to touch on that again because it just feels like it's soup for the soul, you know, to have this person who knows nothing about your life and you can just open up and tell them everything and feel so much better. What kind of role does therapy, and my next question after that would be medication, but let's start with therapy. What kind of role can therapy play in terms of making depression feel less sad? So, Ilana, it's more and more literally the cutting edge of our research that we're currently doing in mental health is about the, the effects of therapy on literally rewiring the brain. We're talking neurobiology, so I'm not going to get into the, the technical terms, but we know about the brain and brain plasticity. Um, and that literally, you know, new pathways are forged when we have different experiences. And that's why therapy is so important, because I think we all can relate that, you know, it's good to talk to someone, maybe unburden yourself, someone who's non-judgmental, someone who's a professional. Um, that kind of maybe makes intuitive sense to most people, if they can put aside the idea, you know, if I go to therapy, I'm crazy, which is just, you know, an absolute misunderstanding but as, as Sherry was talking about the stigma, it's one of those misunderstandings that really doesn't have a place in our modern world, but it's there. Um, so yes, talking, offloading, having your own place and space, but also again, like I'm saying, literally rewiring the brain um, is what therapy does because being able to talk and to share with someone who can help you rather than a friend who, you know, friends are fantastic, don't get me wrong, but your friend also then wants to share what's going on with them. And it's a whole different kind of relationship. With therapy, there's no other relationship like the therapeutic relationship and for good reason. So it's really important that that is destigmatized um, because when we're in therapy, we talk about the present and our struggles and the past. And we know how much the past is related to current struggles and especially depression, more and more in the kind of depression that, like I'm saying, you know, one understands maybe COVID people have lost jobs or there are all sorts of things. And there's kind of a reason that's easy for people to immediately identify. But the kinds of depressions that are more longstanding, there's more, you know, there, there's that kind of longstanding something that, that wasn't enough or wasn't there or was too much 
um, that haven't been dealt with and have been buried deep down inside cause depression. And so therapy helps not only with the current actual depression, but with you know, unpacking and working through traumas and pains and neglects in the past so that your present becomes different, your lived experience is different. So it applies to depression as well as all sorts of difficulties of daily living and life's very hard. Even people that, that seem to have the most wonderful life, life, life is hard. Of course, some people, you know, we all have it differently. Um, but then when you, when you speak about de de depression and the medication, so medication can't cure depression. It can't cure anxiety. But I think Dr. Yael has been cut off uh, and perhaps she is also suffering from load shedding there where she is, but I've still got Sherry here with me. I see a few new eyes as well. A warm welcome, everyone. Hi there. We're talking about how to recognize depression and anxiety in the home. We're chatting to Sherry Hansen. Uh, we just had Dr. Yael until moments ago, our clinical psychologist. But Sherry, while I had you, I uh, have you. Dr. Yael spoke about something that made me, made me realize that um, before we get to medication, right? She spoke about depression, recognizing it, and then also going to therapy. Now, I just want to check with you. Hi, Dr. Yale, are you back? So switch your microphone on, because I can't hear you. Do you have load shedding where you are? Sorry, yes. We That's fine. So I was just going to go into a question with Sherry, so I might as well just complete it quickly. So are there, are there practical examples of telling self while, while you are not sure whether you want to be in therapy, therapy just yet? Are there practical examples to say to self, don't judge this feeling. It's okay to feel this way. It's okay to have this sadness. H how does one get there instead of the other way where sadness can take you in a total depression? I think... Um... Ilana, one of the things that I do when I work with, with children and adolescents specifically is, um, you know, it's very difficult when someone says to you, when you're feeling depressed or you're feeling anxious, what are you worried about? Or what are you sad about? Or why are you feeling so sad? Everything's good in your life. And you've got that feeling that you, you, you don't understand why it's sad. And I, I often say to parents, don't try and rationalize an irrational thing. Um, it doesn't feel good when someone says to you, but you've got nothing to be sad about or you've got nothing to worry about. It feels like they don't understand. And then you feel even more alone and more anxious. Um, and I think what we have to do is we have to help people tap into the fact that they, they have a lot of survival skills and um, in, inside them and that it doesn't matter if we make the wrong decisions about things. We, what we need to help our children understand is that they're going to survive whether we make the right decision or we don't. Mm -hmm. And we're a little bit of the generation of smoothing out the path for our children in, instead of allowing them to, to, you know, tumble over the humps and bumps and learn a little bit of resilience. And obviously, you know, as a mom, I understand we don't want our children to feel any kind of pain or, or anxiety. But um, if we take everything away from our children, we also take away the ability for them to feel that they can cope with certain things. Um, and, and one of the things that we need to help our children do is to understand and reach out. When, we, when we're feeling not good, we need to reach out. Most people actually do have support systems. It's the, it's the not being able to reach out to the support system that gets us into trouble. You have such valuable advice to, to, to reach out and to be able to, to help people. Uh, if you just joined in, we're chatting to Sherry as well as Dr. Yael. Uh, doctor, we can see you perfectly. You've got amazing Wi-Fi in, in load shedding. <laughs> so we're going to continue your conversation. Whoever's helping you is doing a great job. So, Doctor, we were talking about, I just want to make sure your mic is on. Can you talk for me? Yes. Okay, can wonderful. Me? We can hear you perfectly fine. So you were talking about medication and you were saying that nothing can cure depression or nothing can cure an anxiety. So that's, that's where we lost you. Okay, so just to, to clarify, so it, it's not, so medication can't cure it. Certainly with therapies, depression and the cause for depression and different anxieties. I mean, when we talk about cure, we have to be very careful because you know, it's, it isn't like a sort of chicken pox model. We, we have to manage our moods and our struggles every day. 
but certainly in the long term, therapy is the thing that changes things. But medication helps certainly in the short term and for some people in the long term, just to manage those symptoms. And that can be literally life-saving. And also, if someone is very depressed and they come to therapy, they may not feel that they're able to even talk and bring their struggle until their mood improves a bit, which is what medication helps with really well. So it's important that someone who is feeling this way, or if it's your loved one, you know, that a professional is consulted and you get the advice to know what is the best way forward. And sometimes it takes some tweaks, you know, the medication, as we were saying last time, it's not a, it's, there are all sorts of different combinations and each person's different, what's going to work for them, etc. their side effects. So it takes a while to, to find something that, that really works for you. But that's why it's important to have patience, but to also know, so medication won't cure, but it will help. It will help some people a lot. I'm, I'm, I'm staying with the, with the thought of uh, medication will help people a lot. And, and this is the story. So I met a dad who said to me, the reason he medicates for depression is because he knows how hard it feels without it. And it turns out that one of his children now needs to be medicated as well. And he made the decision together with the mom that they would rather medicate than not medicate. Is there also, is it a good idea to, to take away medication uh, during this time when children are not in school saying, you know, let them feel, you know, let them feel what it really feels like in order to build this resilience. You know, they've been on medication all this time and now we're going to try and cope um, without medication. What's your, what's your opinion on medicating and going off and then medicating again? And um, yeah, what, what do you think? So I imagine this one's for Sherry. I know we will both have the same, I would imagine the same opinion about this. All right, Sherry, what do you think? Look, I think for, <clears throat> firstly with medication, um, with the kind of medications that you would take for anxiety and depression, it's not something that you, um, you it's not a decision that one takes lightly and it's definitely not one that, that one makes on one's own. You, you need to be consulting um, with a doctor both when going on medication and when going off medication because going sort of willy-nilly about these medications and taking it on Tuesday but not on Thursday can make a person feel really, really bad. Um, so we have to take those things into very consideration. Um, going on to medications, I don't know if you're referring to Ritalin or if you're referring to, to no anti-anxiety. Anti so they're very different medications. And um, the, the kind of medication that you would take for anxiety and depression is accumulative. So it, it builds up in your system and you, you can't go on and off it like you would with Ritalin. Um, I don't think that, um, it, you know, the point of taking medication for anxiety and depression is to be able to feel, not to be able not to feel. It's not a tranquilizer that blanks you out. Um, it's something that takes the edge off and that is is messing when you have anxiety and depression it messes with the wiring so the messages that you're getting from your brain are not always accurate because of the world being the world being terrible or something imminently so trying to do with that medication is take the edge off so that you can actually feel the way you would normally feel without um you know without medication I like how you say feel without medication. So it, it doesn't take away all feeling and therefore you will be happy all the time. It just makes, and I'm trying to summarize what you, what you were saying. It just makes you feel um, less, uh, it's more accurate. Your feelings are more accurate than what they would have been um, without the medication. Am I right? Sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear you exactly. I think the internet just dropped for a minute, but um, I, what, I think what you were saying is what it, what it feels like to be on the medication. Um, someone once shared with me that it's, it's almost like someone's gently holding your hand through life. It doesn't change your personality. It doesn't, um, alter, it, it's not this sort of wow thing. It's just someone gently escorting you through life's difficulties so that you can manage and think you know more clearly and and you know with the full spectrum of emotion so 
we're getting some questions and I already want to go through them. David, I saw your question, but I'm first going to touch on anonymous as one. This one says, is anxiety and depression um, mimicked possibly within the home? So is it something that you can see and then say, I am going to be like that, or I'm also going to do what they are doing? So is it mimicked? And uh, this one says, for instance, if a mom or a father has it and then a teen picks up the behavior or the pattern. So, um, I'll, sorry, if you hear my dog barking in the background, I apologize. You know, I think that, that so, so someone's bringing to life this idea of depression and anxiety being in the family, which is something that, that we do find. Now, people will often talk about the genetics and say, well, that's proof of the genetics of depression and anxiety. But in fact, it's, it's more and more we find proof of the context that a child lives in. So mimicking, you know, it's, it's not the correct word. And, and maybe there's another question there. But if a child grows up and her parent or his parent, you know, is very anxious, um, that means the child grows up with at least one parent, and that parent can't be a container, a secure place for the child to kind of lay their head to rest or, or lay their worries down. But actually the child then gets a sense, well, the world is very dangerous and scary because if my mom thinks it is, it must be because we are the most important and powerful people in our children's lives, certainly until they become teenagers. And then we, we don't know anything at all. Um, but, you know, so, so, and also depression, you know, depression, like I said, it's like when a light gets switched off in the person, children often really struggle because they can feel that mom or dad are, are not there anymore in the way they were before. And so there's, there's a real pain in that. But if a family is not talking about it and explaining what's happening, that makes it so much worse. So this is not to, no one should ever feel the guilt about, you know, oh, that means I'm being a bad mother if I'm depressed, it means I'm being selfish. Not at all. That's why we're saying this is, this is an illness, you're unwell, you need help, and the family needs to know, just like if you broke your leg or, you know, whatever else happened, you know, I'm not myself right now, and it's not the children's fault. That's what really has to be communicated. And then that, children can manage that, children can understand that, if they're of a certain age. It's obviously more difficult the younger children are, but then it's about putting things in place, putting loving caregivers in place, et cetera. So, so that at least the person who is not well can have the care they need. And the child also isn't kind of losing out of that nurturance and that sense of being supported in the family. Jerry, I, I want to talk a bit about lockdown and COVID and what this has come to do. The last time Dr. and I spoke, we spoke about how lockdown has literally come and opened up wounds and people who has never ever wanted to speak about their feelings are now speaking about their feelings. And if you had a pocket from childhood, you know, of a little bit of fear, it was enhanced now and it became anxiety, you know? So it feels like everything has just become exaggerated during this time. From our conversation tonight, I can tell that a lot of it has to do with conversations, conversations with self, with the family, with the children, with spouse. David, before I answer your question, I just want to ask Sherry this, based on all of that, how can one generate healthy conversations in the home um, in order to hear how everyone is. I'll give an example. With my daughters, I started a conversation jar, a dream jar. Now, they are very small. They're three and five years old. So I write down the dream. We're going to go and visit Oma and Opa in Cape Town. Okay, cool. We're going to make bread with mommy. Okay, so we make a challah. So all of this goes into the dream jar. And that's their way of expressing that they're actually not okay and that they're sad about certain things. Or like my husband with our eldest son, who's 15, their way of communicating is a night of fortnight and sitting next to each other and being able to play a TV game is their way of communicating. And now and then there's a nudge that goes, are you still okay, brah? And then the other one goes, yeah, doing fine. And that's as much communication that happens. So how, how would one in, in any other family know where to start when you need to have chats 
and communicate and hear how people are. Because let's face it, what if that is your, your, your stumbling block that you don't know how to chat? So uh, th those are lovely things that you do in your own family, Lana. But I, I, and I think that every um, family has to find their own particular ritual. But I think one of the things that we have to do when we're thinking about communication, one of the cautions that we have to have is that sometimes we forget that our children um, don't need to hear everything. And there's been a lot of exposure to um, this is how many people have died. This is the, this is the recovery rate. This is the our children are actually hearing way too much. And as much as we need to curb our own um, vigilance around the media with COVID, because sometimes, you know, you can really wake up and quickly look how many people have died and what level are we at and where things are going. And it can really start to aggravate anxieties and, and worries that are sitting there. Our children um, listen to all of our stuff and add on to that, they absorb our anxiety. So we have to be very careful about what we are communicating to our children um, and how we are communicating it. And I think that, you know, the, for me, the, the main lesson that has come out of COVID is that the way we control our anxiety outside of this time is to, is to control our environment. So we like when things are happening and, and we like to see, um, we like to make plans around things. And COVID has taken the, our ability to plan and be certain away. Mm. And if we can um, give our children one thing, it's to teach them that we can learn to live with uncertainty that actually we've managed to learn to live with uncertainty. And it feels dreadful and uncomfortable. And we don't know if we're going to be able to go on holiday in December. And we don't know if our businesses are gonna survive post COVID, but we're learning to roll with waking up every day and being in the moment of every day, dealing with, with what we, we need to deal with every day. And when you're fraught with anxiety, you, you aren't able to deal with it every day because you're worrying about what's happened and what will still come. Um, so COVID has really forced us to be in that moment. And I think that those are the kind of conversations that we're having to have with our children. How are you doing today? How are you feeling now? Um, not, not projecting our worries onto them and letting them worry about things that are going to happen in the future. We're getting to some of your questions and it seems like for this family, there is an external problem. But as I mentioned earlier, and that's why I asked those questions, it feels like COVID has just come and enhanced things. How could you counsel a bully in school? This one asks. So it seems like there's an anxiety and a fear around a person and they feel that the person who's doing the harm needs the counseling. How would you counsel a bully in school? I think this one's for Sherry. Okay, I think the thing that we have to remember, um, and I like the way this is phrased, how do we counsel the bully, is that the bully is also suffering with some kind of anxiety and sense of no control. And that's why they're exerting that control over somebody else. Um, and, and I think that when we um, take away, and I think to, to see a child who has been bullied, it's very hard to muster empathy for the bully. Um, but the bully is a child who is expressing his or her negative behavior for a particular reason. And I think if we can provide them with a space to unpack that and think of different ways and see the consequences of their behavior, we give them an opportunity to be doing things differently and to be gaining some sense of um, control and sense of, of agency that they don't have to exert power over other people in order to feel okay. So not, it's, it's, it's a short answer to a big question. Sorry, Sherry, and, and I think you answered it beautifully. There's enough layers already that we're dealing with, you know? Do we, do we, do we phone the parent in, in a practical example? Do you start there? Or is it something that you teach your own child to teach the kid at school? Look, I think there are many ways to deal with it. And I think that um, depending on where the bullying is happening, if the bullying is happening in school, then the school do need to be involved in, in managing that. Um, and sometimes when parents get involved with parents, children get over the fight and parents are left with a big ugly mess that they can't fix for the, between themselves. So I think that, you know, most schools have resources that can be utilized and tapped into in order to um, assist families in, in um, not taking things in a blaming, uh, from a blaming stance and really working out problems so that both sides can get the help that they need. There's another question that says, practical advice to deal with a huge fear in yourself. 
So let's direct it to, to person. So practical advice to deal with a huge fear that is within myself. So I think that that's, and the person has, has left it very broad. You know, there are different sorts of fears. So there can be fears of something, for example, the child that's being bullied, we would understand they'd be afraid to go to school every day. But then there are other sorts of fears, phobias, um, that seem less easy to understand for other people. And those are the kinds of fears where actually, so a fear of, say, flying or a fear of small spaces, it's actually a catchment for all sorts of other anxieties that get focused on that one fear. Obviously, none of this is conscious. None of this is chosen by the person. They're very scared. And they'll tell you, I'm, no, I'm really scared of that one thing. But it's almost a way that the mind collects together all the, the anxiety. And then that particular thing, which can be irrational to other people, is the focus. And, you know, either way, therapy is the way that we manage that. Because one has to unpack what the fears are about. If it's something more practical and understandable, like being frightened of something that is frightening and that you have to face and you don't feel equipped, then therapy can help equip you and, and help you to contain those anxieties and fears. And if it's a phobia, you know, there, there are more targeted ways as at, you know, if someone can't get on a plane, there's therapy that will be briefer term to help you to be able to face that. And then longer term therapy for what's underlying all of that. Because otherwise, if you don't have the longer term therapy, that phobia will just mutate somewhere else. So, and that's a very important thing to, to know because there are, you know, there are no quick fixes with mental health. Tonight, we've learned that we need to communicate in our families Sherry, your compassion, the way you speak about, you know, being able to, to also look out for the bully because they're also someone who's got their own fears and that's why they're acting out. So I'm, I'm really enjoying this and we've run out of time. So I have to ask you for your conclusions. Sherry, if you can reassure a family who's listening tonight in lockdown level two, whatever that means for all of us. Someone said Happy New Year the other day and I was like, yeah, Happy New Year. <laughs> so if, we, if you can give some reassurance to, to families who are watching tonight or today, if you're going to watch this any other time on our Facebook pages, what would you say to them around feelings? Because depression is not bad. Depression isn't bad. And I think that if you, if you allow people to feel and you acknowledge all the entire spectrum of feelings, then we're able to grow from that. It's when we bury it that it becomes a problem, when we become scared of our feelings that it becomes a problem. I think if we can teach our children to, to label their feelings, they're going to have very different behaviors. Wow. And label feelings like I'm sad and crazy or I'm happy and silly and I'm um, I'm really happy that both of you are here. So I can name my feeling now. Dr. Yael, what do you want to say? I think it's picking up from a, the point that Sherry was making about resilience. So resilience isn't about sort of throwing someone into the lion's den to see if they'll survive. But if a family grows from the experience of COVID in the sense of starting to really focus on the family's communication, on how people can listen to one another, how people can talk and share and how things can't just get fixed that actually the struggle continues but somehow we survive that if that's something that can happen in the family then there's no question that families will come out stronger after COVID so that that really is something I think for us to to hold that hope for, for really coming, coming through something incredibly trying and kind of growing the muscle for that. Well, Doctor, you've just reassured us again that during lockdown and COVID, we've definitely learned <coughs> these skills. And if it's not in business, then it is about self and, and about growth. Sherry, it's an honor meeting you. Thanks for your time tonight. And um, if you wanna, you should Google her and go and see her. Sherry Hansen. <laughs> who's joining us tonight and Dr. El Kadish, thank you so much for your time as well it's really been a pleasure thank you thank you hey Chaya you disappeared earlier where were you 
<laughs> uh, I don't know what happened to my thing. I just just disappeared. I can't tell you how and what. You know, I'm not can't control. <laughs> Anyway, between the last webinar and this one, our eyes have certainly been opened to recognizing the signs of anxiety and depression in the home. And hopefully we'll be able to respond and react in the correct manner when and if God forbid faced with it. I thank you both for the useful tips, guidance and support you have so kindly equipped us with tonight. It's a subject close to so many people's hearts, which is heightened during these pandemic times. Once again, I thank you for your incredible insight and expertise on this important subject. Really was most inspiring insightful and ever so interesting. Once again, thank you so much, Ilana, for your thought-provoking questions, your charisma, your contagious smile, and your precious time as always. It is truly appreciated. And thank you everyone else for listening to us tonight. Have a good night.